And we're back at the uh, ThinksCon 2017 conference live from Amsterdam. Uh, I'm happy to introduce you to the next guest, Bruce Sterling. Hi. Hi. So, um, it's uh, thrilling to be live. It is, it is. We're actually live on Facebook. Yeah. Fabulous. So, so what brings you here? Say hi to Mark Zuckerberg for me. <laughs> uh, well, we're, we're in Amsterdam, um, you know, for ThingsCon. We were at ThingsCon 1, and we're also hanging out with our friend Nelly Ben-Hayoun at her University of the Underground here. So uh, we have a lot of friends in this region, and periodically drop by Amsterdam, there's always something cultural going on or some set of errands we have to carry out. Hmm. So what particular uh, uh, things, Con? Do, do you have anything with IoT? Is there, is there, um... Yeah, well, we have our uh, project near the Arduino office in Torino, where you know, they're very big on kit electronics and open source hardware. So we have a residency in that building, which is called Casa Yasmina, uh, which we built like three years ago. And it's now kind of a completed project. It's a little smart home with a lot of Arduino-style gear. It's got smart thermostats, smart doors, smart lights, you know, a lot of tricked out little objects, got a Roomba, various kind of, kind of toys. So it's becoming the hospitality suite for Arduino and the Torino Fab Lab there. But it's pretty much a done deal. I mean, yeah. just, you can like rent it on Airbnb. I mean, it's furnished and it's, it's, it's a little apartment. So we're now working on other odd little projects and kind of keeping up with developments in the scene. We're going like? to Maker Fair tomorrow. You got some Maker other examples of uh, products you're working on? Now? <clears throat> well, you know, I think there's a uh, kind of a groundswell to put Internet of Things aside and go toward Industry 4.0. And that's because we're in a post-Internet era. And we're just looking at a balkanization of the Internet. And we're going to see people trying to do things from a local situation. And I've thought that would happen for a long time. And I think, you know, there's a key to the Internet of Things and that things kind of have to be local. There just aren't a lot of global things. So once you start digitizing things, they take on more of a regional flavor. And uh, you know, as somebody who was involved in the maker movement for a long time, I thought it would probably integrate pretty well into Italian craft practices. And I think that's in fact the case. And I think it's kind of, it's, um, it's kind of useless to fight against that. There are areas where that kind of deracinated things work, mostly airports and hotels, where you actually have passers-by who aren't committed and who, who are sort of genuinely global personalities that are kind of winking in and out of existence. But in other areas, the, um, the stubbornness of things is very, it runs very deep. Right? And it's hard to get emotionally attached to things that are plug and play that you throw away, right? Um, and especially it's unless it's a nice robot. Well, you know, I, I, I like robots, but I like a localized robot better. Right. Right. And I think you can have localized smartness. And I think we'd be better off with localized smartness, or at least. We need more cultural differences. Yeah, uh, you know, um, we just need more variety in our society. We can't, we can't turn every object, we can't Uberize every object in space that we have. Uh, airports, yeah. Prisons, yeah. Uh, emergency camps, sort of. Uh, hospitals, sort of, kind of. So those are areas where kind of traditional Internet of Things practices make sense. But um, in the long run, they're going to regionalize. And they're also going to be like better adapted to the entire human lifespan. Like, you know, for an Internet of Things, in the usual sense, you have to like put the phone in front of it in order to sort of like see what your app says about it. Okay, a two-year-old doesn't have a phone, but he's still a member of the household. In fact, he needs a lot of attention and loving care because he can easily kill himself. I mean, if you're two, you're super energetic, but you have no street smarts. You're all about, why can't Miss, Mr. Fork and Miss Wallsocket be friends, right? And if you've ever been the parent of a two-year-old, it, it's very hard to find any Internet of Things service that actually improves the life of a small child. They allow the user with the phone to spy on the child, but they don't really do much for the child by himself. No, it's for the parent. Yeah. You know, and now you're seeing scandals like this bizarre... The hacking, YouTube hacking thing. of that. Yeah, well, they're just YouTube, kind of yeah. like generating children's entertainment and like profiting by it without thinking of the child's 
lived experience at all, right? I mean, they're just kind of like exposing children to this kind of raw, algorithmic data generation in order to like keep their face fixed to the glass plate. Okay, I wouldn't say that's like illegal. I actually, or even unethical. I'm betting the guys who invented that are like really happy about themselves. But I don't think that's like the way we ought to raise small children, okay? It's like something like is missing in our society there. And the same goes for a woman of 92 who just doesn't want to be a high-tech whip-snapping participant in a cutting edge, you know, and she's like one of us. And I mean, she's great grandma. She doesn't need privacy, but she needs dignity, right? What? I mean, she needs respect, and she, wants, she needs to be like listened to as a participant. So if we talk about IoT, I mean, is, is, it not that, uh, is it not the phase that we're in? It is mostly about hardware and, and, uh, and, and, and the fact that we have to connect all these devices ourselves and set up rules and how they uh, uh, talk with each other. And is it not just in the next phase where the, the, the intelligence becomes more important and that it will adopt to your life and your needs and, and you don't have to do an input, but right. well, it's you basically know, that, there? That, that's a very good description of sort of one paradigm among many. But I've been very interested in these kinds of digital actual interface issues for a long time. So I remember them when they were ubiquitous computing or ambient computing or you know, smart objects or you know, a, sort of a dozen other methods, which are usually pieces of jargon that are tied into power cliques and funding centers. Right, and in the end, they never prom a lift up to no, the No, in the end, a lot gets done, but you know, it's like the information superhighway was like a super big mm -hmm. thing at one time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now we have that, but we wouldn't call it that. No. And it's not like the cables vanished, because no. we still got the big cables. It's just that. They've got other owners. They're being laid by Facebook and Microsoft instead of the US government and so forth. So to see Internet of Things turn into Industry 4.0 is very interesting. And I would actually encourage people to use that term in Europe. I think it's the European version of the IoT. And I think you just, if you're somebody who's working in the Internet of Things and you happen to be European, you're better off using that, even though it's basically the same thing, or, you know, or IoT is a subset of it. Because you've got the political issues of the Internet that are you know, severe because of cyber war and market surveillance and international struggle, everybody's got them. It's not, the yes, it's not yesterday's internet. It's not the early academic internet of small no. pieces loosely joined where everybody's an equal player. We're in an area of industry consolidation, uh, big tech, Google, Monopolies. Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, yeah. I mean, if you're a European player in this area, you need to think about the like, fate of Nokia or you need to realize you're basically competing with General Motors when you're competing with Facebook, Apple, Google, Apple, you know, Amazon, or Microsoft. And General Motors, like in a country with like a severely perturbed political situation, right? So you can't just like accept what they're doing without buying into Trump's technology paradigm, such as that is, Twitter, <laughs> uh, you know. Um, and I think that's just, it's the political reality, and it's also the technical reality, because the guys who are currently running the United States government are demagogues, they're not technocrats, they don't understand what's going on, they're not gonna make wise decisions about where Europe should be putting its own resources. And people in California would tell you the same thing. Sure. So but back to the IoT in, in, uh, in Europe, you say you, we, should, we ought to call it uh, uh, Industry 4.0. Yeah. Um, and so what is the main difference then? And, and, and how, it's German. And, and it's also about <laughs> decentralization, I think. Uh, so, so how can we just decentralize everything? Well, I think the main difference there is that it's German. <laughs> but I like, I like things that have a .0 in them because they imply an expiration date. If you say, I'm working in Industry 4.0, somebody's going to come along and say, well, this is 5.0. And that means that your utopia has an exit strategy. You can sort of say, well, you know, we, had, we did that it for like 12 year. quarters, and you know, we achieved this, and we like, these are the dead ends, and we kind of like draw two lines under that, and now we, we like- We moved on. Yeah, exactly. And you know, in an area of uh, you know, dynamic adaptation, you need, you need that kind. You don't want to build like a super galleon or the Queen Mary, you need like a fast moving barge. I mean, you basically need a canal boat, right? 
So, and Industry 4.0 will serve you that purpose. It's not popular. It's not about Facebook. It actually is about industry. It's about the industrial internet of things. It's about improving heavy stuff, cities, heavy lifting, big infrastructural things. I think that makes sense. I think Europe's got a lot to teach the world in that regard. Um, if you're like a Dutch guy and you're going to Houston, Texas, which recently drowned in a major league hurricane, and you say, hi, I'm here from the Internet of Things, they're not going to be super impressed. If you say, I'm here from Industry 4.0, can I talk to you about your levy problems? You might actually get a useful hearing, right? I mean, it's right. just like, it's just better public relations. Right. So uh, one of the, the, the main topics here is, is, uh, is well, IoT in the sense of uh, how can we create IoT that has built in uh, or has privacy from design, by design, right. as uh, uh, ethics by design, those kind yeah. of things. Do you believe in that? Um, yeah, I think you could probably regulate it. I mean, I, I think that's probably the best response to big tech in Europe is just regulate their activities and tax the daylights out of them. I mean, but how, how can you regulate it? I mean, is there, are you going to check every <laughs> single device? Them. Yeah, you arrest them. Ah. Even if they are manufactured in China? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the devices aren't secret. There's like all kinds of ways to arrest devices. And, you know, they're, they're not that hard. I mean, you know, the idea that like you can do stuff on the internet and sort of like nobody will ever find that out, the kind of like nobody knows you're a dog. Okay, in the internet of things, everybody knows you're a dog. I mean, everybody knows you're a dog now, right? I mean, the days of that kind of easy anonymity are over. I mean, what you've got now are like, state-sponsored state cyber war actors and you know black hat hackers who are operating from out of um, money laundries and intelligence agencies and doing covert activities in your society. Okay, if you say, oh, well, we can't do anything about that because it's actually just like Chinese hardware. Okay, that's like a um, advice of doom there. I mean, that's just not gonna help you, no. right? I mean, you, you will end no, up. I'm happy to hear that from you, well, as, you know, as you're, you're, you're a you're very optimistic up. person usually. Well, you know, I, I'm very interested in the parade, right? And um, what would bother me would be if the Internet of Things was sort of tedious and it had faltered on its major issues and wasn't getting any traction anywhere. And there's a lot of things that Internet of Things zealots wanted to make a lot of money doing, which just didn't work. But 90% of venture capital efforts failed. And that's realism, right? I mean, it's not realism if you're the VC yourself or if you're the startup guy. You need to, like, you know, be Napoleon for your troops every day. But if you're someone more like myself who's, like, a journalist, a critic, an analyst, yeah, I know that your chances of dying on the ramparts are 9 out of 10. And I also know that if you know that's a possibility, you'll, like, fail early, fail off, and circle around and try it again, and eventually they'll, you know, an area will open up where you're, where you can, um, where you can uh, uh, prevail. You know, you're actually like going to do something useful and interesting. Well, you've been you've been in uh, following technology for so many years. Have you ever, you've probably been approached, but have you ever invested in a, in a company? Uh, no, I, I'm not a VC guy. I don't have enough money to throw around. You know, if I had money to throw around, I usually spend it on educating myself. I go to events. I pick up books. You know. So nobody, uh, uh, no, I, I'm, I, I'm a judge a lot of the time, but mostly like culture stuff. I have consulted for companies, sure. you know, yeah. but um, I'm not a captain of industry. I wouldn't, you know, and also oh, money. Oh, no, but sometimes people just I mean, get, get in the situation. They get, they get, they get yeah, the well, you know, question a lot, a lot of money. Then, there's been periods when a lot of money showed up in my life, and people have, like, urged me to go put it in, I don't know, you know, various mad hatter schemes, but I just don't enjoy it, you know. I, I find it like a kind of slavery almost. And what I like is sort of getting up in the morning when I feel like it. And that's not something that a guy in the VC business can do. It's great know. luxury. So, uh, it is, and, to and worth a lot of money, True. really. Yeah, to finish up, I mean, uh, uh, there's probably gonna be next things con uh, next year. What, what, what should be the topic? Um, you know, whatever's, whatever's getting traction. Uh, you know, I think they need to be more regional, and I like it that they have cities' names after them. It's like ThingsCon London, ThingsCon Amsterdam, ThingsCon Nairobi. 
There's a things con Austin that I didn't know about, even though I'm from Austin. That's like my stomping grounds there. You know, and I think that's good. And I think there's like a um, there's a there's a possibility there of a kind of confederacy of these local groups who sort of say, okay, we want to be local, and we don't want to impose our ideas on you, but we can share tools with you, right? And I think that's kind of good because it reminds me of literature, right? If you're like a great Italian novelist, you're not really in direct competition with like a great Japanese novelist, and you don't have to write his books, right? But Rather I'm like, not. Yeah, but you know, it's nice to be aware of what they're doing without like copying what they're doing. It's kind of like, okay, well, you know, how can I like become more Italian by seeing how Japanese you are? You know, and we're both literateurs, and one of us will get the Nobel, and you know, well, translate your work, and you could translate my work, but it's not like I sort of stand up and say, I'm the Microsoft of literature, and I'm going to declare darkness the standard. You know, I think, you know, that kind of a... Um, so more diversity, more decentralization, uh, uh, embrace and, 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 you know, difference. And, and just, just kind of a deeper awareness. I mean, because, you know, what we have in... Things con is, you know, it's a coders and engineers approach to daily life, but daily life is more than coding and engineering, and it actually needs more than that. I mean, you need to think of your role as a father, as a citizen, as a participant, as, as a voter. I mean, you can't, you can't, even if you can, even if you imagine you can reduce all those things to apps, you've got a real problem because the apps will go away long before you yourself are 92 and in a wheelchair. And you need to understand that eventually you'll be 92 and in a wheelchair and that you're basically inventing your own retirement home with these kinds of interventions, right? So it's just like, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, um, how is it? You're like a, you're dancing to the music of time there and you're sort of, you can have your utopias but just, don't lock the door, right? And just you need to understand that, like, you're, you're gonna like drift from one to the other, and you kind of have to like stop, smell the roses, inhale, and like have a more uh, a more humane and wiser, and just like a more civilized approach to what you're doing. And that's why I find the European scene really interesting. You know, I mean, they don't just sit down, hammer out some grocery code, and try and figure out what the return on investment is, right? And I, I've spent time in California. I got married in California. I know Californians very well, but that's their ideology, and it doesn't really apply to local circumstances very well. You know, it's not going to make you happy, and it doesn't make them happy. All right. Um, well, so next year, we're also going to talk a little bit more about how we can make people happy. I think that's, uh, you know, it's a better approach. Yeah. I mean, you know, people... And a more holistic you know, approach. People, people in design, you know, have that kind of... Uh, they have that, that kind of narrow and... What is it? Technocentric approach. But if you're actually going to design cities and daily life, you need a broader... And take into yeah, account you need, yeah, you just the people you do a, it for during all these man's kind of you know yeah. you need a broader spirit, right? Yeah. And the people here are very bright. I think they understand that. I think they're actually up to the task, right? I mean, I've seen people in code get a lot more sophisticated than they used to. I mean, in the early days of computation, the objects were hideous, and now gadgets are like beautifully well designed. We've got the like pieces really, of art sometimes. They're they're the handsomest stuff our civilization has to offer, but our civilization has to develop. It can't stay like it is. True. It needs to move into some new area. We have tools that, you know, tools and approaches, and also just ideas, ideologies, and cultural depth that we're not bringing right. to the problem, right? And if you want to live, you kind of have to live. You can't just code and engineer. You need, you need to live. We need to live. You need well, to thank live. you very much for that. Right. That's a great final words. Just stay, stay there. Sure. Thank you for watching again. Uh, we'll be live this whole afternoon from ThingsCon Amsterdam. I just let me say ThingsCon Amsterdam. Amsterdam. Just, uh, Amsterdam. 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 Gotta love because them. Because Bruce loves that, that there's uh, all local differences. Uh, so stay tuned uh, for our next guests. <laughs>